Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 375, uh, featuring part two of my interview with Tim Lang. Uh, and this is a, a really good section of the interview, I think, because he's talking about uh, how he got started at New World Computing and uh, working on games like the uh, Might and Magic series. Uh, but he came in at a very pivotal, pivotal time. Uh, the company had just been bought by 3DO, and there were a lot of uh, big purges going on at the company. It's some pretty dark stuff, but also some uh, very inspirational uh, stories here as well. Anyway, a lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Tim Lang. Doing my job and and got an email like a, a email blast from from a guy named Steve Ibarra <laughs> and and about lost my shit because <laughs> you know he's he's one of the original interplay guys and and uh, Ibarra's mystical coat of armor from Bard's Tale was was named after him and I, oh my god oh <laughs> I uh, I don't think I ever got a chance to actually meet him and talk to him because he was on a different team but. But I was very excited to know that we worked together. <laughs> so tell me more about this uh, work you were doing with Bard's Tell Construction Set. Uh, that was, um, <laughs> I had uh, I was in college at the time, and and uh, you know it came out long after Bard's Tale three, and it was a Bard's Tale f oh Bard four is on its way. That's right, Brian had kickstarted that. So um, it had come out. Probably on uh, 1992 or 93 or so, and I had just bought a uh, 386. So it was my first foray back into computing. So I'd I'd gotten this computer and I was playing Syndicate and and uh, Wing Commander and stuff. And, and I was like, wait, Bard's Tale construction set. <laughs> and and so I bought it from, from I think I got it from Newegg or something. And, and I was like, oh my god, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a Bard's Tale. <laughs> yes. And and the I picked. Um, I called it the theme from Flood. So basically, it was based on a They Might Be Giants album. <laughs> so one of the quests was you had to um, you had to get a rock and then find a piece of string to wind the rock around and and things like that. And and like a lot of the projects I'd started at the time, it never got finished. But but it gave me a lot of of uh, insight into you know how much work is actually in. In, like how much logic work is in making role playing games? Like, you know, you can't just say, "Okay, here's the quest, um, go do it," because then when the guy comes back to the quest guy, you have to say, "Okay, now you're on the quest. What does he tell you? Now, when you finish the quest, what does he say?" And and, and that gave me a lot of a lot of insight into that. I think, which uh, served me a lot later. Yeah, I think uh, that, that's great. Yeah, I think so many people that play these games, they have no idea the amount of work that goes into them right there. yeah they just yeah. kind of have this picture this really easy time oh yeah, let's create a quest and <laughs> throw yeah, this dungeon together in an afternoon it, when when we were doing might magic nine yeah um i had to stub out all of the npc dialogue and which basically was just like like you know generic words uh linked to this line of conversation blah 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 blah, blah. and it took me th three or four weeks of straight just that was all i did to get through all the npcs and not even their real dialogue just like placeholders and that i mean we had almost 400 npcs in Might magic nine that had all had individual unique dialogue and that was small i think i think daggerfall and, and morrowind had thousands and and i don't even i don't even know if they did uh, unique dialogue for all those. Definitely, probably not for Daggerfall because that was very much a, a procedurally generated game. But, but yeah, it's it's a, <laughs> it's a lot of work. <laughs> so I listened to your interviews with uh, Drew, and, mm -hmm. uh, Three AM Gaming. I'll put a link to those those shows. Uh, yeah, uh, for yeah. you for you folks. If you haven't watched those uh, with, over uh, Three AM Gaming, just follow the links and. Uh, you might want to go watch those now. <laughs> I want to dig <laughs> a little pause deeper. Right now, go watch. Yeah, go watch in. those. I, th I know Drew yeah. would appreciate that, and then we can you can come back because uh, uh, I want to dig a little deeper into some of the same areas that yeah. he was covering. Yeah, sure. I uh, want to just trying to get a better picture of what you were like, you know, back uh, when you joined uh, New World Computing. I, you had a mohawk, and mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how wild. Uh, 
Yes. <laughs> we used to have a pretty mild mannered sort of nerdy people on the program. Sounds like you were um you know you kind of crazy. Surprised, actually that that uh um you know when I started I I had I wore a baseball cap and and you know I I cuz I was a I was a punk rocker in my college days and and you know so I dyed my hair and mohawks and and listened to a lot of uh, uh East Bay punk rock so like the uh Green Day kind of sound and and yeah, so I showed up and, and like, well, I can't exactly go and wear have a mohawk. So I wore a hat to the interview, and and uh, a couple days later, I'm I'm sitting there working on uh, Wages of War, and I take my hat off, <laughs> and and my boss comes by and he just ruffles my head. It's like, what is this? And I'm like, it's cool. I'm throwing it out, it, you know. And and he laughs. It's fine. I don't care. And and then he walked away. But he did tell me later. He said, "You know, if, if I'd known you had a mohawk when I interviewed you, you wouldn't have got the job." <laughs> That's weird. I mean, so it's kind of a button down. New outfit. World was New World was a really cool kind of mix of of uh, sort of corporate professionalism with with a bunch of old friends. You know, so. So the, the the office, I mean, you didn't have to wear a suit and tie or anything, but but you, it was in an office building and it was very plain. The the decor was very plain. I mean, I know a lot of a lot of game studios now have creative spaces where they paint the walls different colors and do wacky things. Um, but this was very much a, a, I mean, if you would have walked in, you would have expected, oh, this is an insurance company or something. But but uh, everybody there was was uh, passionate about games, uh, good friends with each other, supported each other, and and you know, one one tidbit I thought about earlier today that when you were asking me like oh what should I ask JVC? Um, I wish I would have thought of this is that that uh, every Tuesday I think it was Tuesday um, at five o'clock sharp John would shut down the office. And and him and a handful of old timers, probably seven or eight old timers, would gather in the conference room, order some pizza, and play Dungeons and Dragons all night. <laughs> and and that was the kind of kind of group it was. Very tight knit. And and I've unfortunately not really found that again since I've been at a studio. But but a lot of those people were lifelong friends. Uh, been to their weddings. They they came to my wedding, and you know. Nice. Um, so it's, it was, it was really cool. And I, and I miss that a lot. It sounds quite a bit different. I had Dr. Cat on not too long ago and he was telling me about these, the sort of how, how outlandish things we get at origin systems with Mm -hmm. Lord British and these crazy haunted houses and all this, uh, these big birthday parties. And (laughs) so it sounds like, it sounds like new world couldn't have been different. Well, we had, it, it, there was still some wacky parties, uh, after hours, you know, we'd go. Uh, a couple guys had had a, a house together, and and they'd host parties all the time. And we basically they'd they'd host land parties. They bought ten computers and and set them all up in in a spare room or something. And we'd go and we'd play uh, Half Life or Team Fortress. I think it was Team Fortress. It was right about that time. And 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 uh, after hours we'd do the same thing at work and and you know shut sh- all lights off and and start playing uh, half-life or whatever and, and uh but yeah there was not a lot of of like you hear stories about the old ea days where they had had nerf guns and and stuff and and uh it, there wasn't much of that uh like just crazy in the middle of the workday wild antics yeah, it's interesting. Maybe that's uh, since it was sort of relatively mild, or maybe that's one of the games. And there's so much wacky stuff that happens in the games. You know, <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe they, we all had very quirky <laughs> senses of, sense of yeah. humor. Senses of humor. Um, right. That a lot, of, a lot of uh, um, Star Trek fans. So there's a lot of Star Trek references show up in in Might and Magic and and uh, Star Wars too. I it, actually <laughs> when 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 I was on. Uh, when I was doing uh, Might Magic Nine, I had an item, a bow that was called the Buffet Bow, and and I think we we cut it because we're like, well, Bow Buffet was a little too much. 
but I think even still, like I've I've been on some of the websites uh, where they talk about the the obscure references in mm-hmm. in all the like, magics, and and I think there's still some that, that I mean, on, especially Might Magic Nine. I just I went crazy. You know, everything just about was a reference to something. <laughs> you know, and they picked up the easy ones like Lindisfarne Monastery and and uh, uh, Bob and Doug from Strange Brew and, and things like that. But I, there's still some some in there that, that I'm sure I've forgotten. It's like, oh, yeah, that was something. I don't <laughs> <what? laughs> you know But I do have a funny story about that. Um, so, you know, Might Magic 9 was, uh, was very much a Viking-influenced sort of story. Um, at the time, I was I was uh, very interested in in my own uh, Scandinavian ancestry. So, so I was like absorbing anything Viking. <clears throat> and, Understandable, and, I, completely understandable. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, but but you know, I've still got the quirky sense of humor. So, um, instead of Asgard, we used uh, uh, Arslagard, and which uh, I don't know if you know is actually a kind of a dirty word in Swedish. <laughs> What's and, the word again? Uh, uh, Arslagard. Arslagard. It just means, oh, it, just arse, means you know, it means, yeah, arse. It's, it's <laughs> ass garden. Uh, <laughs> ass garden. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know and, some games that should have been called that. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So we were, you know, one day we had, uh, you know, I'm sitting there working, we had uh, uh, a bunch of Scandinavian journalists come through. Really? And and, uh, you know, they were walking around the office, and we had this big wall of uh, concept art. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm sitting in my office doing my work, and, and, and I hear our uh, general manager, who's been taking these guys around, um, call out my name. And I, 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 you know, put my head out the office. Yeah, uh, what's happening? Hey, come here. Come here, Tim. <laughs> and, and, uh, and he goes... Uh, what does Arslagard mean? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm like, oh, oh, I'm caught. <laughs> like, uh, 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 and he's like, are you stalling because you know what it means? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he didn't say nothing. He's just, okay, uh, next part of the tour. <laughs> That's good. Oh, you got away with that one. <laughs> oh, wow. So when you came in, I guess I'm trying to imagine, what was it, Heroes 2? Uh, yeah, Heroes 2. Uh, uh, Wages of War. I mean, how big was, War. this wasn't NWC's heyday at this point, right? Or, or was it? I'm this sorry. was, um, I mean, you know, NWC kind of had, I think kind of had a couple heydays. Yeah. You know, when uh, Heroes 1 first came out, when they did the Cloud of Zine, way back in the beginning when there were Ziploc bags, I guess you could call that a heyday. Uh, this was kind of in a, I guess you call it a quiet spot. About how many other people it, were there? Uh, at the time, it was right when right when 3DO had bought New World. Oh, okay. So that was a crucial time. Yeah, and there was probably it was actually a big uh, um, a major shift in in focus for for New World. There was probably thirty or forty people at the time. There was a staff of maybe ten testers, and most of the rest of the people were producers. Or marketing, or or something along those lines, because uh, I, I think a lot of people don't realize that some of the non Might and Magic sort of games that New World did were were third party. So New World was a publisher more than more than a developer. So like Wages of War was was a game that New World was publishing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, they were so doing lots of poker, casino, that type. Yeah, of thing. yeah. So yeah. well, th- we called those the poker games. We called. Uh, um, uh, those were the games that kept the lights on, <laughs> you know, because they 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 were very easy to do. They they uh, sold fairly well, and and they were just a easy sort of income that we could use to pay the bills and and then focus on on doing the the fun games. Uh, but about six months into uh, 3DO's tenure, that that focus changed. You know, they already had a marketing team, they already had a bunch of producers, and they said. Uh, Sorry guys, we're gonna let you all go, and focus New World exclusively on being a developer, and which at the time meant meant me because I was a tester. <laughs> uh, but fortunately, I came back. Uh, I ca- actually called back. I said, "Hey, uh, I want a job back," and and they said, "Okay, come on back." Well, that's and, nice of them. <laughs> and 
yeah, it was very weird. Like it, it went exactly like that. It wasn't like like I had to interview or there was any kind of conversation. Like, when can you start? <laughs> so I came back thinking I was going to be a tester. So you must have made a pretty good impression by that point. I I guess I I mean I. The wages of war was was uh, me and one other guy were the only testers on it, and I mean now you yeah. see thousands of testers on a game, but but me and this guy David were pretty much the only guys who who found most of the bugs for that game. But uh, or they were very very uh, um, uh, desperate. <laughs> so I show up and and thinking I'm going to be a tester, and he sits me down in in not not my old seat. No, somebody else was sitting there. Now I had, a, I had now, a seat. who is this? That's uh... Uh, this was his name was Peter. Peter. He was yeah. he was uh, the uh, at the time he was the not the lead tester test manager. Can't remember his exact title at the time, but he ended up being a producer for, there for a long time. Sat me down and said, "Okay, here is uh, MCAD. Here's some concept art of little fence posts and things and walls, whatever. Get to work." <laughs> like I thought I was a tester. <laughs> Like yeah, but we need we need help doing this, and so uh, that's how I became a level designer. <laughs> wow! And and those were the first fence posts and first uh, walls that went into Might and Magic Six. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how many is that a fairly common way that people get into level uh, designers? It was common at New World because I've heard other people say you know if you want to get a job, start it, off it, testing or something. Yeah, especially back in that day. Yeah, I think uh, promoting from test was was a very popular way back then and and one thing that I've always respected about about John and and uh, Mark who was a general manager for most of New World's tenure was they were very very interested in in promoting from within hmm. you know, so so if they needed level designers even after I'd been I'd moved on to to different positions they'd say um, so we're opening new positions uh, who do you think should get it out of the test? We need some more level designers. Pick your people, uh, you know, and they'd ask people who were interested. And and a lot of people who were still in the industry today got their got their start that way. Hmm. As uh, you know, interviewed I interviewed them as a level designer, and and now they're creative directors or whatever someplace. <laughs> You never get that. I knew you back when you were. Yeah, I exactly. created you. I, I made fun <laughs> you so much as a level designer. <laughs> um, but you know, it was the same way for for the the promotions to to like game designers from level designer and stuff. They they technically, I think legally, they had to accept resumes from the outside. But but they send an email blast and say, "Hey, we've got this position open. Uh, here are the requirements. Here's what you need to do." Um, Hand in your like for when I got promoted to uh, assistant designer was was the title. They said, okay, so you need to write a story, um, which I've been doing for years, and and then hand it into Keith Frankhart, who was the director of, of uh, Mind Magic Seven. And at the time, I was like, ah, whatever, I'm fine doing level design. And and there was this guy who I sat across, who his name was Marcus, and he was. He was a he was a really good level designer, really good guy, um, a little opinionated. So he he's like, uh, uh, one time he was very upset at Disneyland because they allowed children in because the children kind of annoyed him. <laughs> they ruined it. Yeah. So he was very upset about that. And uh, but uh, but I was always I felt sometimes I felt competitive with him. And and he said you know he said he was going to do it, and I thought I can't just I can't just let him. <laughs> You know, and we were friends. You know, it wasn't like anything hostile. Uh, but Pistols said, at dawn, though. Yeah, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to write a little story and 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 uh, throw it in. And and I guess my little story was better than his little story. And <laughs> and I got the job, and and he didn't. Although it wasn't it wasn't much longer before he moved on to uh, uh, doing a serious design for heroes. So he. Uh, he, oh, got his he, own. Did, he did okay. <laughs> yeah, he did fine. He did fine. <laughs> Let's talk about Might and Magic Six because that's just—it's one of my yeah. personal favorite games. I love it. Yeah. I go back and play it all the way through uh -huh. every every few years, you know. Uh, and I'm often I'm often trying to think what is it about that game that I like so much, and I think it's kind of like what we've been saying here. It's a serious game, but it doesn't really take itself all that 
Mm -hmm. There's a lot of humor, lots of inside jokes. It's uh, it just seems like it's uh, designed to be fun. You know, it's it's designed more to be fun than to try to impress (laughs) somebody. I think think that's something that that uh, modern games forget. Yeah, amen to that. That that uh, you know they get they get so tied up, and this isn't just just current. This you know this sort of thing's been happening through, throughout it, probably the history of gaming is is they get so focused on um, the graphical beauty and the realism of the mechanics and and things like that. They forget that that uh, it's a game. It's supposed to be fun. <laughs> kill some rats, silly, you know? <laughs> yeah, and I mean you know those those sorts of serious games have their place. Yeah, you know. Um, uh, like their horror games are are that probably would not be as fun if you were uh, lighthearted about it. And one thing that I remember uh, Keith telling me, Keith Frankhart, who who became my boss on Might and Magic Nine, I was very worried about um, the game balance. You know, it was one of the first games that well, it was the first game that I was in charge of all on my own. And and uh, he gave me a couple good pieces of advice, and one of them was, um, when in doubt, err on the side of easy. Hmm. <laughs> and and I'm sure there's tons of tons of hardcore gamers Better out to there. Better be too easy than too hard. It, yeah, yeah, and and uh, and I'm sure there's plenty of people who argue that, like, oh, I want to play on the hardest setting, and and you know, most people have their place, and it's it's fine, it's fine. But uh, but I did that, erred on the side of easy with Might Magic Nine, and. And uh, say what you will about how that game was received, because we all know. But yeah. but so one thing that I think was was fairly universal in the reviews was that it was the balance. It was very well balanced, uh, which I, I personally took great pride in. That's the key thing. <laughs> despite, I just despite yeah. all the bugs in it. <laughs> I just was talking to JVC the other day, and he was like, "That's one of the hardest things to get right is that difficulty." Yeah. Oh. I mean, it's and, another and, one of those aspects, I guess. We don't notice it so much as gamers, right? If it's if it works well, yeah, we just think, "Oh, that's." Uh, you only notice you only notice when it's wrong. Exactly. When it's, when it's too hard, well, you'll say, "Uh, forget this game and and put it down and not play it again." Rage quit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, I've got I've got a fine collection of broken controllers <laughs> that, <laughs> that can attest to that. <laughs> Um, and, but you know that, and that's one thing that that when I've been interviewed at other companies, they we've we've frequently talked about game balance, and and um, I've always taken a very mathematical approach to to how that is set up. You know, and if you look at Dungeons and Dragons, it's it's the same way. You know, there's you when we were doing Might Magic Nine, what basically what I did was I said, um, okay, so each I divided the game into four different acts. And then at the end of each act, I said, what level do I want the player to be at at this at the end of this act? And I said, not what level does a player have to be, but what do I want them to be at? And I and then I'd say, okay, now let's divide, let's calculate the total number of experience points required to be at that level. And I took that and I divided it in half. And then I distributed that among all the quests, so half of the experience of the game, your experience points from the game, come from the from, come from the mainline quests. Then the rest come from fighting the monsters and side quests and, and things like that. And and I think you've got to do it that way in order to have have a good grasp and not have to keep going back and redoing retweaking things over and over and over and over and over. Uh, which we did, we did, you know, on Might and Magic Nine. Um, but mostly what we did was was tweak the the cash value, so the amount of gold you'd get for things. Because that was the one thing that people kept complaining about was, we're running out of money. <laughs> and, and so that was a lot harder to, to, to tweak until somebody said, well, that's because you're going to all the most expensive trainers. <laughs> you know, so basically, like if you read any of the strategy guides now on that game, they say, okay, go to, go to the... the um, Frost guard trainer until you can't go to him anymore, and then start going to the more expensive trainers, and then you end up with more gold than you you can shake a stick at. Like a valuable lesson for college students today to learn, right? You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that that was kind of how I went to college. <laughs> yeah, this. I mean, I have so many great memories of the 
of that game. I know the fly spell was one of my favorite yeah. moments yeah. in all of gaming. I remember first time a casting that and like whoa 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 you know <laughs> this is a huge thing. Is uh, I know that that, that turned was, out to be kind of a problem with uh, the with nine right. Yeah, and I was we we spent a long time and we got a lot of flack for for uh, for taking that out, but we spent a long time trying to uh, trying to figure out how to make that work. It was a problem and with it, the engine, right? That just wasn't. Yeah, and it all came down to to basically time. And and uh, so the the with the lift tech engine, the levels, the the outdoor levels were built in in 3D Studio Max to get all the you know the valleys and nooks and crannies and and things like that. And and the problem with that is that we didn't have past the world vision. So if you notice in Might Magic Nine, all if you go to the edges of of each outdoor map they end in mountains or walls or or something like that because you can't basically you'll see us with the pants down you'll you if you fly up too high you'll see that that the world ends and you look and there's there's nothing and so we're like well we can't we can't do that <laughs> so our compromise was was a spell called fleet foot which was basically like like super running but uh but it was never never as good you know, I, I do remember when I was playing Might and Magic Nine. One you of my a lot favorites. of complaints about they, that from critics or anything? Oh yeah, people yeah. hated the fact that we did that. Oh, you know, and and it was it, it was unfortunate, and and I always wanted to say, man, I know, I know, <laughs> <laughs> but what can I do? You know, and you got Fleet Foot. <laughs> yeah, you got Fleet. Foot. I mean, I know that that like Might and Magic Nine, one of one of my favorite, or my Magic Six, sorry. One of my favorite tactics was flying and then strafing all the enemies. You know, just flying over them and shooting arrows at them and then flying away. And <laughs> you can't do that with Fleet Foot. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's yeah. That's, I did that the same thing too. And it just kind of yeah, sure there's so many did. things that really they didn't they don't seem like all that much fun or they don't seem realistic. I guess, but I mean, it's just fun to do. Yeah, you, know, you could just do that over <laughs> and over all day long. Yeah. The spark spell. Doing yeah, that with the, the spark spell was my favorite because that you know it always bounce around. And <laughs> and that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with the third installment. Lots and lots of great stuff coming up, so stay tuned. Uh, as always, I want to thank you, thank you very much for your support of the show, and it really uh, I could really use your support at this time. Uh, the uh, Patreon support has uh, sort of gone away uh, to some extent lately. I've lost a couple of key people who were uh, just really being super generous. Uh, they've unfortunately ran into some troubles of their own and had to uh, temporarily suspend their support of the show. So there's a pretty big gap there now. And I'd really like uh, your help to get this back up to the $500 level uh, so I can do those uh, transcriptions and other cool stuff for the show. Uh, so anyway, if you've been watching these episodes and for whatever reason haven't stepped up to the plate yet, uh, please go over there to that link in the show notes or go to mattchat.us and look for ways uh, you can support the show. It's not, it's, it's not a one-way street here. I definitely need your help to keep these episodes coming. And uh, If you've already done that, I thank you very, very, very much for that. And if you haven't yet, <laughs> please do. I could really use your help. So thank you. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? All right, let's see. Uh, good old Stig wrote in. This is a really fun uh, little game here. It's called Kinseed, a whimsical sandbox RPG adventure. This is up on Kickstarter right now. And it's uh, by a couple of the uh, Fable developers, uh, Lionhead Studio people. Uh, it's a 2D sandbox RPG. Adventure of a lifetime. You can spend your days adventuring, farming the land, while raising your family or even running your own tavern. That sounds pretty fun. Apothecary, blacksmiths, or good store. Uh, anyway, they, you can go check out the Kickstarter page. As soon as I saw the uh, I saw the graphics and understood the concept, I went ahead and pledged to this. It looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, then also, uh, let's see, uh, Stig wrote in about the Long Dark Winter Mute. Uh, this is a story mode for the Long Dark game. Uh, this has been in early access now, I guess, uh, 
Well, since 2014, wow. Uh, it's, it's a really, it's an interesting take, I think, on the survival game. There's no zombies in this one. It's more, uh, more realistic, I suppose, but it's got a kind of a neat uh, art style uh, that I also like. Uh, I've played around with it a little bit uh, back in 2014, but I see that they've, it's really come a long way since then, uh, in more ways than just the this, this story mode. Uh, anyway, I thought I would pass that along to you as well. It uh, looks really interesting. If you've uh, been playing it, let me know what you think about the long dark and if you're excited about this expansion. Or, or I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> this, uh, uh, the official release, I guess. Uh, speaking of expansions, I think what I was jumping ahead a little bit there. Uh, Galactic Civilizations 3, uh, Galsiv, uh, has got a new expansion out. This is called Crusade. And it's a really major expansion, so I thought it was worthy of a news item. Uh, they've added espionage, a citizen system. Uh, you can actually invade and conquer planets using legions now. Uh, there's, a, let's see what else, a civilization builder tool, uh, new races, new civs, uh, just a lot, of, a lot of bang for the buck there. Now, some of the reviews, I think, were kind of spot on about this. They said basically this expansion makes it into the game it should have been. Uh, to begin with, uh, so I guess uh, <laughs> that's sort of a praise, right? Uh, anyway, I do agree if you're playing a, a Galsiv, you definitely want to check this out. Uh, I've been having a lot of fun. I hadn't played it for quite a while. Come, come back and now I'm already sinking like uh, hundreds of hours into it again. So uh, go check out the Galsiv 3 Crusade expansion. All right, I think that'll do it for the news. What about that ale of the week? Well, this week I've got a little number here called the Pompeii India Pale Ale. This is a Toppling Goliath Hot Patrol, or TGB. And what, what really caught my eye about this was this really interesting label on the bottle. I mean, it, this looks fantastic. And there's a bit of a story behind it, too. Uh, so I thought I'd read this uh, to you. And these, and these guys, by the way, are out of Decorah, Iowa. It goes something like this. A man stationed atop a survey tower noticed an ominous cloud rising in the distance. He hesitated, unsure of what to do. Could he do anything? He sounded an alarm, but to no avail. Like a swooping gull, the ash moved in, filled the lungs, and froze the spirit. It was the last day of the city of Pompeii. Centuries later, its legacy lives on. The beautiful mosaics that once graced the rooms of prominent buildings now are honored in a bottle. Pompeii India Pale Ale. <laughs> a, kind of, a bit of a dark and ominous story behind that, but it's, uh, they really did do a good job on the bottle. Now, unfortunately, there's not any other information on this. It doesn't say uh, what the alcohol content is, or the international bitterness units, or anything like that. So uh, let's just get it open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Pompeii India Pale Ale. Here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Ah, wow. Ooh, really, just a really nice aroma on this one. You can definitely smell the hops in this. It's very sweet, almost a cinnamon-like uh, aroma. Well, it just smells wonderful. Awesome. <laughs> Let's give it a taste. Oh, it's got a very uh, deep taste, a lot of flavor here. It's kind of a, a little bit of a roasted, uh, malty kind of flavor to it. A little bit bitter, but not too bad. Um, almost kind of like a, like a marshmallow-y like flavor to it. It's, it's really good. Let me try it again here. Yeah, yeah. I think they did a great job here. You get the uh, that sort of a hoppiness, a little bit of a bitterness. You you would think is a very typical of a, a India pale ale. Now, there's a little bit more going on, though, on the back end. It's, it's some interesting uh, flavor combinations. I don't know what kind of hops are in this. Uh, they sadly didn't list those, but uh, I will say it's tasty. Now, let me give it one more uh, swig here. Yeah, I think this is a very, uh, a very good IPA, I would say. It's uh, just the right amount of bitterness for me. Well, sometimes I can get a little carried away, I think, with these IPAs, but this one just... It really does the trick. You get a lot of hoppiness, uh, some interesting textures on it. It's got a wonderful uh, aroma. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if I want to go a full five out of five on it. Uh, it's, it's so close, but yeah, you know what? What the heck? Uh, I will go five out of five on this. Uh, a really good flavor, really good IPA, and, and this. Uh, you know, look at this bottle. You know, it's just really cool. 
and it'd be a great uh, thing to be uh, to have around. You could talk about Pompeii with your friends as you're drinking this uh, IPA. So that's it's really cool. All right, so let's uh, wrap it up with a quotation. And I was uh, looking for proverbs by Vikings. I don't know what we talked a little bit about Vikings in the episode. All right, and I found a. There's actually a lot of uh, really cool Viking proverbs out there. I had no idea. You could, you could <laughs> sink a few hours into reading all of them. Uh, but anyway, this is the one I thought uh, kind of stood out to me. Uh, I really enjoyed it anyway. Uh, let's see what you think. It goes something like this. The foolish man thinks he will live forever if he keeps away from fighting. But old age won't grant him a truce, even if the spears do. See you guys next week. five minutes to get up there and five minutes to find white are you sure you know what you're doing ask me again in ten minutes time <laughs>